Welcome to New Life Assembly of God Media Ministry. We are glad that you are here. We believe the Word of God is relevant and life-changing, and we hope you can be blessed by this message. If you'll take your scriptures in hand and turn with me to Joshua chapter 1, we're going to be reading verses 10 through 18 in just a moment. This is our last message in our vision series for this year, Heart for the House, 2024, the year of more, and today's message is entitled, Commit more commit more have you ever watched any of those fitness uh commercials where they're trying to sell you fitness equipment like uh peloton or bowflex or uh, nordic track or one of those big name machines and they have these 30 minute infomercials and all of them claim to be the latest greatest technology guaranteed to burn fat faster and tone muscles better than any other fitness equipment amen Some of them go so far as to offer you a 30-day money-back guarantee if you haven't lost pounds, lost inches, and if you haven't built muscle, and if you don't feel better than you have in years, they say all you have to do is that within 30 days, simply return the machine, and you will get a full refund, no questions asked. They'll even pay for the return shipping. Amen? But let me tell you something, folks. I don't care what guarantee there is. You can buy the equipment. But if you don't commit to work out on that machine every day for 30 days, you're not going to lose an ounce. You're not going to reduce an inch. Amen? Why? Because with every promise, there is a condition. They promise it's the best machine to tone and lose weight, but there's a condition. You got to use it to lose it. Amen? In this case, we want to lose it. (laughs) Amen. Sometimes we say use it or lose it, but in this case, you got to use it to lose it. Amen. (laughs) But you know, every promise has a condition, and it's true for God as well. For instance, God promises that He will hear us from heaven and He will heal our land if we what? Humble ourselves, turn from our wicked ways, and pray. There's a condition. God promises He will provide all of our needs if. We seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And you'll see that promise condition formula throughout scripture. God says, I will do X, Y, and Z if you will do such and such. Amen. What does that tell us? We cannot claim the promises of God until we have committed to fulfill the conditions that God sets. This was the problem with Israel. God promised to give them the land of Canaan, but they had to act in faith and go up and possess the land. But do you remember the story back in Numbers 13 and 14? I'm going to summarize it rather than reading all of those verses because of sake of time. But you go home and you read Numbers 13 and 14. Israel has been delivered by the miraculous hand of God from 430 years of bondage in Egypt. And God parted the Red Sea. They crossed over on dry ground. Three weeks later, they are at the border of the promised land. It is within view. Amen. And God tells them to send 12 spies into the land, a leader from each of the 12 tribes, because it was going to take a commitment from all 12 tribes to possess the land. So Moses selects 12 representatives, from each, one from each tribe. They go into the land, they come back, and they are carrying fruit so humongous that it takes two men carrying a pole on their shoulders to carry one bunch of grapes. Isn't that amazing? But it was proof that they brought back to the people to show them that the land was indeed a land flowing with milk and honey, just as God had promised, a fertile land. And Joshua and Caleb say, let us go up and possess the land, for God is giving it into our hands. But the other ten spies said, there are walled cities And there are giants in the land. And we are like grasshoppers in our own sight. We cannot take the land. So guess who all of Israel listened to? Not to the two uh, faith-filled representatives, Joshua and Caleb. They listened to the ten naysayers, the ten faithless, who said we can't do it. And so they rebelled against Moses. And God declared that because of their unbelief and disobedience, 
that he would judge them by causing them to wander in the wilderness for 40 years and that every one of them of that generation, the adult generation, would die in the wilderness and they would not be able to enter the promised land. And that's exactly what happened. The promised land was theirs, but they failed to possess it because they failed to fulfill the condition. God has a promise for this house, a vision that he desires to fulfill for us, his people, to make this body a church without walls, reaching into every sector of this community with the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit to produce fully devoted followers of Christ who love God, love one another, love to serve, and love the lost. God's desire is to raise this church up in this South Florida area to make an impact on this community and upon the nations for the glory of his name. And this promise is ours. It belongs to us, but we will only possess the promise if we commit to fulfill God's conditions, a principle that he clearly teaches in Joshua 1. Read with me, if you will, Joshua 1. We're going to read verses 2 through 3, and verses 6 through 10, and then verses 16 through 18. Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land I am giving them. I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set foot, you will be on land I have given you. Skipping down to verse 6. Be strong and courageous, for you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors I would give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave to you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful. Notice there's a condition. Be careful to obey all I've commanded. Then you will be successful. A promise, a condition. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so that you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then, see there was the condition, study the word, be careful to obey all of it, the promise. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. Verses 10 through 11, Joshua then commanded the officers of Israel, go through the camp and tell the people to get their provisions ready. In three days, you will cross the Jordan River and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you. Verse 16, they answered Joshua, we will do whatever you command us. Here's the commitment. We'll do whatever you command us and we'll go wherever you send us. We will obey you just as we obeyed Moses and may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Anyone who rebels against your orders and does not obey your words and everything you command will be put to death. So be strong and courageous. 40 years after they had disobeyed God at the border of the promised land, Now, under the leadership of Joshua, God, for a second time, commands Israel to go up and take the land that he is giving them. And folks, God's promise remains the same, and the condition remains the same. A commitment to obey. God's promise for this house remains the same. It will endure through the passing of the years, but whether or not we see His vision become a reality depends on our commitment. It depends on our believing the promise, committing to the vision, and acting in obedience. And this passage shows us Joshua and the people's response of faith and obedience that enabled them to possess the promised land. And it teaches us how we need to respond to see God's vision fulfilled for us the first thing we see that is the vision is God's imperative and it's required to experience his promised future God speaks imperatives or commands to Joshua I'm going to read from verse 2 from the New King James Version something I want you to know is that the two most accurate English translations of the original Hebrew and Greek texts is the King James or New King James, and the New American Standard. The other versions, while they are useful and may be easy to understand, sometimes because they are translated thought for thought and not word for word, they sometimes leave out important information. 
So that's why most of the time I use New Living Translation when I'm preaching for ease of understanding to the audience. But when there's something specific that I want to bring across, I usually go back to the New King James Version. So we're reading verse 2 from the New King James, and it says, Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan. And what this makes very clear is that this is a command from the Lord. What am I saying? The vision is not a suggestion. Joshua understood that it was an imperative, a mandate, a command. This must happen. And vision is the future that God has planned and promised to his people. And for us to experience his promised future, we must respond in faith and obedience. So Joshua communicates the vision to the leaders and commands the leaders to call the people and tell them what he has said and then call for them to commit to faith and obedience. And that's what I stand here doing today, sharing God's vision for this house to be a church not contained within walls. We do not exist for ourselves. We exist for the purpose of God and we exist for the sake of those who do not yet know Jesus Christ. And so we are called to be a church not contained within walls. We gather on Sundays and Wednesdays and other meetings that we have and fellowships. We gather to be encouraged and equipped so that we then go forth from this place and we are scattered as the church to reach the lost. Because, folks, we're the church wherever we go. We're not just the church when we're here. We're the church wherever we go. And we are mobile churches because we take Jesus wherever we go to make him known to those who do not know him. Amen? So God's vision for this house is to be a church not contained within walls, reaching our community and the world in the love of Christ with the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit to produce fully devoted followers of God who love God, love one another, love the lost, and love to serve. Now, can you see with me a day when the gospel has been so pervasively preached in this entire South Broward area, and thousands upon thousands have come to Christ, and we can no longer say 95% of people living within five miles of New Life Assembly of God do not know Christ. I would love to be able to say 95% of people living within five miles of New Life Assembly of God now know Jesus Christ because we have gone forth into our community in the power of the Holy Spirit and made Christ known. Amen? Amen. That's what God is calling us to do, to reach the lost. And just like the church in the book of Acts where it says daily people were being saved and God was adding them to the church. That's what God wants to do in and through us so that this entire area will be transformed by the gospel. I read to the book of Acts and I see where whole cities, like the city of Samaria, whole cities came to Christ. Folks, if God did it then, he can do it now. And more than the fact that he can do it, he wants to do it. If we will commit to faith and obedience, believe that he can do it and obey by going forth. And a good way to believe and obey this week is to take seven invite cards and invite seven people to come with you to the house of the Lord next week. Just break down that faith and obedience into some very simple acts and before you know it, it becomes a lifestyle. It becomes a lifestyle of living out that obedient walk of fulfilling God's vision through our lives. Can you see with me a day when every person in this congregation has become a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ who loves God with all of their heart, mind, soul, and strength. They love one another as themselves. They love to serve, just fitting in wherever they see a need, and they love the lost so much that wherever they go, they are telling people about Jesus. Can you picture it? Because in my spirit, I picture it all the time. Amen. But to see that fulfilled, It requires a commitment of faith and obedience. And Joshua and the people's response teach us what it takes to see God's vision fulfilled. The imperative of vision requires prompt response. 
prompt response. Verse two starts with the word now. Now, therefore, arise. Now. That means, write it down because it's going to be profound. Now means now. Write it down. When God speaks, we are to act without procrastination, without delay. We need to have the heart that David expressed in Psalm 119 verse 60 when he said, I will hurry without delay to obey your commands. Let me say that again. I will hurry without delay to obey your commands. That was the heart of David. And God said David was a man with a heart after God. What does a heart after God look like? It looks like a heart that says, I will hurry without delay to obey your commands. Wow. Now means now. Let me, let me say it to you this way. God's motto is today. The devil's motto is delay. God's motto is today. The devil's motto is delay. Why? Because delay gives opportunity for disobedience. The more you put it off, the easier it becomes not to do it. Delay becomes opportunity to disobey. Have you ever noticed that when you want to do something, you usually can get to it and do it pretty quick? We make time for the things that are important to us. We are eager to do it. So let me ask you a question. Don't answer out loud. How much do we want the will of God in our lives and in our church? Because if we truly desire to experience and walk in the will of God, we will not delay. We'll do what David said. I will hurry without delay to obey your commands. When we put things off spiritually and don't act promptly, we end up disobeying and it will cost us. Just like it costs the children of Israel, it will cost us. There was a little girl who every Sunday she would ask her father to go to Sunday school with her. And every Sunday he had an excuse. And he'd say, honey, maybe next Sunday, today I just want to relax and rest, I'm tired. And years passed, now older, he finally found time to go. But then, when he said to his daughter, honey, let's go to church, she refused. And she said, daddy, I'm tired. I just want to rest and go to sleep. His delay cost him his daughter's soul. Folks, we need to act now or there will be a cost for our disobedience the imperative of vision not only requires promptness it requires a plan in verse 9 joshua is commanded by god and in verse 10 joshua commands the leaders of the tribes and in verse 11 the leaders of the tribes then share that command with the people That was the plan. That's how God works. He works through his leadership to the body. God always calls his leaders to embrace the vision and commit first. The leaders set the pace and direction for the people, and the vision unites the people together to act as one to fulfill the vision. So leaders, I pray, if you have not already done so, that you will wholeheartedly embrace the vision of this house, that it will burn brightly in your hearts because as you catch fire, the fire will spread and be ignited in the hearts of others. God always calls the leaders to commit first. And I do have to say I'm very glad that we have a group of godly leaders who have embraced the vision and who are committed to action to see it fulfilled. And I hear it it, even in conversations outside of our vision team meetings. I hear them talking about the vision and the future of the church. And I'm so grateful for leaders who have a heart for God's vision for this house. God's plan always involves the commitment of leaders first. In Joshua 3, we see it again. When they prepared to cross the Jordan, 
God instructed the priests to put their feet in the water first. The spiritual leaders of the people, they were to be the first to put their feet in the flooded waters of the Jordan. And when their feet touched the waters, the waters parted and they had to stand until all in the midst of the parted waters until all the people had crossed over. What was that? God setting a pattern. The leaders commit first. Amen? As the leaders committed first and stood firm in that commitment, God blessed and the people of Israel were able to cross over on dry ground. When the leaders stand up and commit to stand in faith and obedience on the vision, God will bless and he will miraculously enable the fulfillment of that vision. Some of you might be here saying, well, praise God, that's great for the leaders, but that leaves me out because I'm not a leader. Let me ask you something. Are you involved in girls' ministry, Royal Rangers? Are you a children's church worker? Are you a youth leader? Are you a prayer minister? Are you a deacon minister? Are you one of our deacon board members? Are you a worship team member? Are you an evangelism team member? Are you an usher or a greeter? Are you a father or a mother or grandfather or grandmother leading your family? And guess what? You're leaders. Because leadership is influence. And wherever we have influence, we are a leader. And God calls us to commit to faith and obedience first. God's plan is for you to be the first to see, embrace, and act for the vision to be fulfilled. To rise up in faith, commit to action, and work to see the vision accomplished. Thirdly, the imperative of vision requires preparation. Verse 11, go through the camp and tell the people to get their provisions ready. In three days, you will cross the Jordan. In three days. You know, waiting for God is often the most difficult part for us, right? But days of waiting are always days of preparation. If you've been waiting on something, it's because there's a work of preparation taking place in you. Amen? Amen. Days of waiting are always days of preparation in God's work. There is no wasted time waiting on God. The leader said, get ready, for in three days you shall pass over this Jordan to possess the land. They needed to do their part to prepare their provisions so that when God said, move, they were ready to move with him. If you reflect back on Numbers 14, looking at the story when the children of Israel were at the promised land and they believed the negative report of the 10 spies who said, we can't go up and take the land. And so they disobeyed and then God pronounced judgment upon them. And he said, because of your lack of faith and disobedience, you're gonna wander in the wilderness for 40 years and every member of this generation is gonna die. You're not gonna be able to go up and possess the promised land. Well, when they heard that, they changed their mind and they said, we'll go up now. And we'll possess, but Moses warned them, don't go up because God will not be with you. When he first said go up, you didn't want to go up and he was with you then. But now he says, you're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And now you're saying, okay, we'll go up because we don't like the other alternative. But don't try it because God's not going to be with you. So you know what? They went up anyway. But God was not with them and they were sorely defeated. What does that teach us? We've got to move when God says move. We've got to be ready to go when God says go. Amen? Because delay will cost us. Delay will cost us. They were not ready to move when God said move. And when they wanted to move, God was not with them. And it cost them dearly. Being ready for us means preparing ourselves spiritually. It means preparing ourselves in prayer. It means preparing ourselves in the study of God's word so that we're ready to minister, so that we're ready to reach the lost. It means preparing ourselves in ministry uh, by equipping ourselves and by taking training, by planning, by organizing, so that when God says do, we can do. It means preparing ourselves financially so that we are not encumbered with debt, so that when God says give, we can give. Or God says, go into ministry, we can go into ministry. Amen? In 1991, I was serving at a church in Miami. 
and they offered me the opportunity that they were going to mother this church and this is something God had already spoken into my heart six months before they presented this opportunity they were going to mother this church by giving us twenty six thousand dollars for the first year that was supposed to cover our rent and a nine thousand dollar salary for the year for me now first of all nothing in this area could be rented for the whole twenty six thousand dollars and secondly, in 1992, even back then, $9,000 was not much of a salary at all. But you know what? I've always committed myself to living a debt-free life. So when they presented that opportunity to me, God had already spoken to me that he was going to do this six months before, that he was going to give me this opportunity. I didn't have to think twice about it. I didn't have to hesitate and say, oh, but how will I pay my bills if I go start a church and get $9,000 a year? I just said yes, and I went with it. And you know what? Within one year, we had grown sufficiently. We were running over 200 in attendance that we were paying our rent. I was getting uh, uh, an accommodating salary back then uh, as, as we uh, grew. And so God provided. Amen. But if I had not prepared myself by making right financial decisions, I would not have been able to go when God said go. Amen? So we have to prepare ourselves so that we are ready when God says now, Amen. and we can step out. We need to be ready when God says it's time. We need to prepare now so that we'll be ready to move when God says move. The imperative of vision includes a promise. The second part of verse 11 says, take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you. That's his promise. And what's that promise? The success was guaranteed by God. God will never waver from his promise to us. All of the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. God has already said yes to it. Amen means so be it. It's already accomplished. All of this right. through Jesus Christ. Amen. Everything God has promised to us is already ours. We just have to appropriate it to our life as we walk by faith and obedience. The vision for this house is already a reality in the heavens. God has already granted it. What we must do now is rise up to possess the vision by our faith and obedience. Hallelujah. I love the words of Pastor Tommy Barnett who uh, built one of the largest churches in the United States several decades ago and pastored it for many years. But he uh, preached one message one morning and he was preaching about there's a miracle in your house from the miracle in the Old Testament of the God multiplying the oil as the woman filled the empty vessels. And Pastor Barnett looked at the church because they were trying to build and everything and, and he said to him, he said, I have great news for you this morning. God has already provided all of the finances that we need to build our building. Everybody jumped up and they were cheering, praise God, hallelujah. And then he said, there's just one thing. It's still in your pockets and bank accounts. <laughs> hallelujah. I have great news for you this morning, church. God has already provided everything we need to build our new building. That's the promise. The condition is, hallelujah. We just got to give it because it's still in our bank account. Praise you. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We got a promise. But it requires the condition be fulfilled. The imperative of the vision includes a people. Verses 12 through 15 outlines the fact that all 12 of the tribes must fight until they possessed all the land that God promised. Even the two and a half tribes that decided they didn't want to cross the Jordan River. They decided that they wanted to stay on the east side of the Jordan. That that was good enough for them. They saw the land was good for their tribes. They were willing to settle near enough to the promised land, but not in the promised land. So they were going to live in the borderland. But it reminds me of a little boy who kept falling out of bed at night. And his mother asked him, why do you keep falling out of bed? And he replied, well, mom, 
I guess it's because I sleep too close to where I got in. He was sleeping on the edge. Many Christians are living on the edge. They live on the border of the world and the border of the kingdom of God, but they never really make a wholehearted commitment. Nobody here, I'm talking about folks at the church down the street. But you know what? There's no fence sitting with God, amen? And the decision of these two and, two and a half tribes to stay on the other side of Jordan cost them later on. Because we see in 1 Chronicles 5, they were the first tribes to be invaded and captured by the Assyrians and carried away, and they never returned. Why? Because they were contented to sit on the fence, to stay on the border, to live in the borderland. Notice that God commanded them, even if you want to stay on that side, God commanded them to fight to possess the promised land. God expects all of his people, turn to your neighbor and say all of his people. people. Turn to your other neighbor and say "All all of his people. God expects all of his people to participate in the fulfillment of his vision. And every person plays a vital role. Throughout scripture, you find that God blesses first corporately and then individually. On the day of Pentecost, a ball of fire descended in the upper room and then it separated as flames of fire upon each person's head. Corporate blessing, individual blessing. This is God's pattern throughout Scripture. Meaning that when God's people as a whole are blessed, each family and person among his people will participate in that blessing. When we all work for the vision to be fulfilled, not only will the church be blessed, but our lives, our families, our homes will be blessed. Amen? Now, the second principle we learn from this passage, the imperative of God's vision requires a response of commitment. And this commitment involves a pledge. Verses 16 and 17. They answered Joshua, we will do whatever you command us and we will go wherever you send us. Hallelujah. I can't wait to hear that from every person in this congregation. Whatever you ask me to do, pastor, I'll do it. Hallelujah. The famed preacher, Henry Ward Beecher, listened as a man described his horse to him. He said, oh, this horse is so good. He'll work any place you put him, and he'll do all that any horse can do. And uh, Beecher said, I wish he was a member of my congregation. (laughs) Hallelujah. (laughs) It'll catch up with some of you in a moment. (laughs) A missionary society wrote to David Livingston, who was one of the first missionaries in modern time to go to Africa in the 1800s. And this missionary society asked him, have you found a good road to where you are? If so, we want to send others to join you. Livingston wrote back and said, if you have men who will only come if they know that there's a good road, I don't want them. I want those who will come even if there's no road at all. Amen. Folks, God is not looking for people that are just along for an easy ride, but for people who are willing to commit completely to his purpose. There's a tendency towards consumerism in the church today where people come to church just for what they get out of it. Oh, I come to church to be encouraged. I didn't like that message this morning. It wasn't encouraging. It was was too challenging. I I, I don't want to commit. I just want to be poured into None of you ever said that. Hallelujah. I want them to play my music this morning because I can really get my spiritual vibe on when it's my songs. But I didn't like the songs Pastor Tony picked this morning. They they, they just didn't, you know, connect with me. None of us ever thought that way. Hallelujah. But I want to feel good in worship. I want to be prayed for. I want to be ministered to. But don't talk to me about serving. Don't talk to me about being in ministry. Don't talk to me about witnessing. Don't talk to me about giving. Just minister to me and tell me what God wants to do for me. But most of what God says he wants to do for us 
carries a condition. Every promise has a condition. And that condition is obedience. Obedience to walk in faith. Obedience to serve. Obedience to witness. Obedience to do his will. Hallelujah. God calls all of us to commit to walk in faith and obedience to do whatever it takes to fulfill his vision. And he promises us, if you will do all of this, then I will give you success and I will prosper you. You see, the promise and the condition. And this commitment involves prayer. Second part of verse 17, and may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. They are making a faith declaration over Joshua. They were saying, we're praying for you, Joshua, that just like the favor and anointing of God was on Moses, that God will bless and anoint you. Folks, we need to commit in prayer to pray for our pastors, to pray for our leaders, to pray for the vision to be fulfilled because without him, we cannot do it. Amen. But with him, all things are possible. All things are possible. Church, we have the promise of God, but there is a condition if we are to possess the promise, if we are to fulfill the vision. God is calling us to commitment a commitment to embrace and support the vision that he has given for this house. He is calling us to commit, to pray, to work, to witness, and to give. And we need to respond the way that the children of Israel did to Joshua. All that you have commanded us to do, we will do. Wherever you command us to go, we will go. God is calling every one of us to commit. None of us are allowed to stay on the sideline just like God didn't allow those two and a half tribes to stay idle on the east side of Jordan. None of us is allowed to sit idly and just watch the rest go to battle and reap the benefit. We must commit to serve, to pray, to witness, and to give. And this morning, if you haven't already done so, I want to encourage you. There's a blue card in front of you. Get involved in ministry. Just fill out your information on the front and commit to serve in one of the areas of ministry on the back. Just check it off or write it in and we'll have somebody get in touch with you and get you involved in ministry. Let's work together to see the kingdom of God built in this place. And if you have not already made a commitment, a faith promise to give to the work, to building the house of the Lord, this is not your tithe, this is an offering above and beyond your tithe to build the house of the Lord. It's a faith promise that says, God, I'm believing you to supply this, and as you supply it, I'll give it. And you just fill that out, and at the end of the service, you can hand it to any of our ushers, and they'll make sure it gets to our office. But we're gonna make tangible commitments. You can commit this morning to take seven cards and invite seven people this week to come and worship with you on Easter Sunday. So commit in all of these areas to work together and believe together to see the vision of the Lord fulfilled for this house. But the first step to seeing God's vision fulfilled and being a part of it is to have a relationship with God. We are all sinners and sin has broken our relationship with God. And that's the whole reason that Jesus left heaven and came to earth and he committed his all. He committed his all to save us. He gave himself on the cross. And today, when we place our faith in Jesus and repent of our sins, and the word repent simply means to turn away from, when we turn away from our sins, ask God to forgive us and receive him by faith into our life, that very moment, we are born again. We are brought into right relationship with God. Would you bow your heads with me? If you're here today and you have not yet repented of your sins and placed your faith in Jesus, but you would say, pray for me, pastor because I want to be forgiven of my sins and I want to have a relationship with God. Or maybe you prayed and gave your heart to Christ years ago, you've drifted away and you need to come back and you'd say, pray for me, pastor. I wanna come back to Jesus. If you fit into either of those groups, would you just slip your hand up and just say, pray for me, pastor. I wanna come to Jesus or I wanna come back to Jesus. Is there anyone this morning? Thank you for that hand. Is there someone else this morning? Praise the Lord. 
Hallelujah. 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 Amen. For those of you that raised your hand, I'm going to ask you to pray a simple prayer with me, and I'm going to ask the entire congregation to pray along to encourage those that are praying it for the first time today. And as you pray it in faith, God is going to do exactly what you ask him to do. Would you pray this prayer with me, dear Jesus? I believe that you are the Son of God. And I believe that you love me so much that you died for my sins. Today, I repent. I turn away from my sin. I confess that I am a sinner. And I ask you, to forgive me of all of my sins. I invite you to come live inside of me and help me from this day forward to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Congratulations on making the best decision of your life, amen. And we welcome you to the family of God. You were just born again into the family of God. This is a beginning. That prayer is a beginning. We want to help you continue in that faith journey by sending you free of charge a little booklet that will help you understand that prayer and the next steps to take. But to send you that free booklet, we need your email address. So if you'd take your phone out and just text your email address to the number on the screen, we'd appreciate it so we can send you this free e-booklet to help you in your journey to keep going with the Lord. So please do that right now. To those of us who are already believers, you've heard the vision. Now it's time to make a decision. Will you commit to respond in faith and obedience to see the vision become reality? By committing to serve, to pray, to witness, and to give, to see God's vision fulfilled in this house. Amen. If it's your heart to commit in all of those areas to see God's vision fulfilled, will you stand to your feet right where you are as the worship team comes by? And from your own heart, some of you are already doing these things. You can recommit. But all of us, God is calling all of us to commit in these areas. And so would you just talk to God from your heart and make that commitment to the Lord, especially in those areas that you know that you need to go full force into with your fulfillment, with your obedience. Heavenly Father, I thank you for all of those that are standing today. I thank you that they have heard your word with an open heart and a readiness to obey. Father, as we stand before you today, we make a commitment or a recommitment this morning, Lord God, that we are going to believe and we are going to stand in our commitment to serve, to pray, to witness, and to give to see your vision become a reality in this community, in this church. Father, we make this commitment before you and before the witnesses of this entire congregation. Lord God, help us by the Holy Spirit to live out this commitment long after this service has ended, O oh God. Father, in Jesus' name, we pray this and we thank you for it, Lord. You may be seated for a moment if you have not already filled out either a faith promise card or one of these uh, cards to connect in service. I encourage you to do so right now as the worship team leads us in song. And when the song is finished, we'll dismiss and you can give your cards to any of the ushers. Thank you for joining us today. If you were blessed by this message, would you consider giving a gift to help support our ministry? You can text any amount to 954 516 1522. That's 954 516 1522. Thank you, and we hope you will join us again.